Hi, I'm David Edelman, a neuroscientist and paleoanthropologist, and welcome to the podcast On Consciousness with Bernard Bars. Roundtable episodes of the podcast On Consciousness with Bernard Bars were recorded and filmed in the dining room of my father's home in La Jolla, where my parents lived for more than 20 years. Our journeys into the nature of consciousness serve as a tribute to my dad, Nobel laureate Gerald Edelman, his energy, creative imagination, prolific output, and all the chats we had about the problem of consciousness and biological science in general during our years together in Southern California. We're here today with Bernie, acclaimed author in psychobiology, including his newest book, On Consciousness, Science and Subjectivity, Updated Works in Global Workspace Theory. Bernie is the recipient of the 2019 Hermann von Hemholtz Life Contribution Award by the International Neural Network Society, which recognizes outstanding achievements in perception by individuals whose scientific life contribution to the field of neural networks was proven to be paradigm-changing and long-lasting. Also joining us is Dr. Jay Geed, a child, adolescent, and geriatric psychiatrist by training. Jay is the Chief of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at UC San Diego, Fukui University in Japan, and at Johns Hopkins in reproductive medicine. His overarching interest for many years has been the brain and how it changes throughout life. As scientists, as philosophers, as human observers, under what conditions can we infer that some living organism is conscious? Consciousness is truly the difference that makes a difference. Today's discussion is about the rich variety of conscious experience by virtue of the richness of our sensoria and the capacity for the brain to pick this all apart and put it back together both developmentally and evolutionarily. So Bernard Bars has just joined us and Bernie famously is the originator of the global workspace theory of consciousness, as well as the author of a new book on consciousness, which is a collection of his works revisited. So these are new versions of work that Bernie has pursued over, say, perhaps the past 30 years, would that be about right, Bernie? Something like that? Yeah. Yeah. So let's go back to what Jay and I started with. We, we started with the, the notion of consciousness. Uh, we wanted to get around to the, to the definition of consciousness, what it means to each one of us. We didn't quite get there yet, but it's fortuitous that you're here now, so we can, we can indeed pursue that. What we also talked about earlier, Bernie, is how we can study consciousness as a phenomenon, as um, a process in the brain. And one thing that was really, really interesting about your previous work, about what you've done, is how you highlighted the difference that makes a difference. And this is a sort of not just a, a neat catchphrase. I always liked it. But also, there's something very deep about this. And Sleep, in fact, is a really interesting aspect of behavior that maybe gives us a window on the difference between conscious and non-conscious processes in the brain. Because there is a distinct difference and it's recordable, we can observe it, between the waking state in the brain and the brain when it descends into, say, slow wave sleep, into some sort of deep dreamless sleep, versus the sort of shallow, rapid, eye movement related form of sleep, which a lot of people would think of as a sort of a riff on consciousness. It's not the same as the conscious, the normal waking consciousness that all of us experience uh, in our waking lives, but it is a form of consciousness, it's sort of the brain talking to itself. Let's leave that aside for the moment. And as well, let's leave aside the importance of memory to consciousness, something else that Jay and I discussed earlier. Let's go back and let's kind of get a bead on what consciousness means to each one of us. And I'll, I'll sort of start with myself. Uh, I have a, a relatively simple definition of what I think consciousness is. It's more or less based on my dad's definition, my father, Gerald Edelman, who was uh, at work for many years on his own, uh, his own theoretical sp perspective on consciousness. But what he left me was a really interesting definition, which is the notion that you can sort of reduce consciousness to two bullet points, maybe a little bit simplistic, but it's a good starting point. The first aspect is the weaving together of various sensory streams into a unified perceptual whole. That is to say, uh, different 
different sensory modalities like vision, auditory, being woven together into something that is a unified percept, right? That's the first aspect. The second aspect of my, of my definition would be the importance of memory to that. In other words, the persistence of that gestalt, the persistence of that unified whole in memory over time. And I'm a little bit liberal about that, as I think I've told you guys before, that I, I think of memory as, as a, a sort of a pseudo-stable construct in your head, a pseudo-stable but dynamic construct in your head that kind of holds together. It doesn't have to hold together for very long. Some people think of memory in terms of seconds, minutes, hours, days, a lifetime. Mm -hmm. I start in terms of my, my feeling of memory over time in milliseconds because a representation, if a representation can hold together for say 100 milliseconds or 200 milliseconds as perceptual unity, it's still a memory of sorts. But let's kind of go around the table, starting with you, Bernie. How might you pick apart what I just said, if there's anything to pick apart, or riff on your own feeling about what consciousness is? I, I back off a little bit. I agree with everything you said. And I back off a little bit to the general question of if you're a scientist and so you're dependent on the facts, right? And if you don't have the facts, you're lost. Right. And, and you actually contract to many people talk about consciousness. You know that you're lost. Right. right. And so you start to worry about how the hell am I going to study this phenomenon? Mm -hmm. And one great discovery was about paradoxical sleep. Mm -hmm. As you know, of course, and that was Juve in 1954 or something, mm -hmm. around yeah, the mid time. 50s, yeah, mid 50s. And Juve was in an odd position because he was a Frenchman, and the French talk about consciousness all the time. This is not news, mm -hmm. right? To, to the Frenchman, because they have they have Marcel Proust, they have an endless. Uh, uh, understanding of the history of literature and the arts and blah, 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 blah. And they actually have philosophers like Descartes and so on uh, that they understand. Um, uh, although what happens even for well-informed people is that we tend to project the present onto the past. I even think, and I'm going to insult some people here, uh, that the French uh, even tend to project the present onto the past. And that's the difficulty when we try to understand how human beings have thought about consciousness. Mm -hmm. Because I have become reluctantly convinced after all this time that human beings have always studied consciousness, mm -hmm. both their own and each other. Mm -hmm. And the demonstration is basically, if you're a hunter and you're a, for and you're a forager and you're a nomad, uh, uh, you die mm. if you do not understand what the starry skies are supposed to look like when the yeah. clouds are not there, which in Africa, after all, well, I assume that this happens quite often, the nights are clear. And then you have to orient yourself during the day also. And it's very useful to know east and west. Uh, 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 and from that you can, you know, look 90 degrees away and, and there it gets north and south. And if you're going to teach your kids to survive, you know they have to throw stones mm -hmm. with high accuracy and kind of ruthlessness, because mm -hmm. otherwise they're not going to survive. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to reproduce, right? Mm -hmm. Because if they're boys, the girls are not going to be attracted to somebody who's going to make them starve, right? And if they're going to have babies and the enormous commitment uh, of, of having babies and guarding them, protecting them for 10 years, mm -hmm. you know, some enormous period of time. And human beings know these things. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are not mysteries. They might be mysteries to us, mm -hmm. but they're not mysteries to people who have to survive mm -hmm. in, under those kinds of conditions. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things that we do in order to learn and teach is to share consciousness mm -hmm. with each other. Let me just stop you there mm -hmm. now. Let's just reduce, if you can, into two or three very, very short bullet points where that leaves you vis-a-vis -vis consciousness. How would you synopsize your view of consciousness from what we just talked about, which is sort of, in a way, invoking an evolutionary adaptation, right? Let's pin it down. Two or three bullet points, as crisp as you can make it, 
What do you think of as consciousness? Let me modify that very slightly and say as scientists, as philosophers, as human observers, under what conditions do we infer that some living organism is, is conscious? And one of the rather obvious things actually that we use is that uh, we do sensory psychophysics, right? In, in the sense that, you know, the rabbit is a well-defined visual stimulus and it's probably trying to run away at that very moment because rabbits are not in life to get killed. Uh, so they, they're afraid of danger and they, their signs of fear are, are very obvious because they're the same ones humans have. And so here we are. And is the child standing by my side uh, and I was six years old and able to talk and call out rabbit? Uh, and get everybody in the family all excited about that so that everybody starts, you know, rushing after this rabbit and throwing stones and doing whatever they do. So we were talking before about, in a way, the social salience of certain cues in the environment. And, of course, there's an, an, an adaptation perspective on all of this, obviously. You have to eat. Sure. So you had mentioned the rabbit and the perception of the rabbit to say right. a young, let's say a young juvenile australopithecine or whatever it is you're talking about. I don't know that australopithecines yeah. would actually eat rabbits because you know, East Africa, South Africa, hard to say, but may very well. But yeah. but in any case, uh, an early you let's say an early human, a little later on in the, in the game, a young human mm -hmm. spots a rabbit and mm -hmm. vocalizes and sort of further unpack that because it's really interesting because you, you sort of, uh, in, in all of this is implicit a social domain, right? Absolutely, yes. Yes, and, and actually one of the famous uh, developmental experiments on this, which Jay knows a lot about, is the mommy airplane phenomenon, uh, where a two-year-old, I think, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Roughly two-year-old, and let's say the two-year-old is in the baby carriage, mm -hmm. and mom is right here, and an airplane flies overhead, and the little kid, just two years old, amazing action, uh, goes like this, uh, eye contact with the mom, points at the airplane at the same moment, and vocalizes, Molly, airplane! Uh, and that is, I think that's the operational definition of consciousness, because what the baby's doing is sharing his or her conscious experience with mommy. So broadcasting out into the social world, in a sense, right? Just uh, that for sure. And also, uh, mommy has she, oh, this is so wonderful. Right. This is so so beautiful. There's going to be an entailed response by mommy. Exactly. Yeah. But but it's also a sharing. Right, yes. Of, of a model of the world, and and first is you know mom or, or caretaker, and then right. family. Right. But for humans, at least, then after family, it's a wider group. Community and oh, such. exactly. And, and so, in addition to being able to be good at projectiles and you know, the, the skills of acquiring uh, sustenance oh, sure. to stay alive, we need to survive and we need to reproduce. And both of those require um, social skills. Mm. Um, and that was part of our secret of success, I think, is you know being able to um, share a worldview with a wider group. Uh, people, yeah. and I think it, for quite a while, maybe it was forty to sixty. Now it's you know eight billion in terms right. of with the internet, and we're sharing a, a, a common reality like never, like never before. It's fascinating how scalable that is. Yeah. Um, first, you you and your mom, right? You're this is it's, it's wonderfully described. Yeah. You're you're kind of refining it as you're sharing it. Yes. Because in right. a sense, the baby's saying, you know, is that you know like you're trying to sort of test this model to prediction. By, by does mom agree? Is that you know like uh, you? There's some feedback going on here as well. Mm -hmm. No, no, that's a that's a bird, not a plane, you know, kind of thing. Uh, and we're constantly doing this. Like, ah, oh, are we all sharing you know the same model, which could be the origin of some religions or or um, other worldviews that could be specific to certain cultures. But I think it, it it binds us together. So we're really bringing in an interactivity, which is which is sort of uniquely social. Yes. And this is interesting because um, I'm going to play devil, not exactly devil, maybe yeah, devil's advocate. Devil. Let's say I'm going to play devil's advocate because there's a long history. You know, of course we know there's a 
really long history of life on Earth, right? 3.8 billion years at least. Mm -hmm. You know, very nearly, you know, maybe 600 million years plus after the, the Earth itself formed, you know, four and a half billion years. So a long history of life on Earth, not so long a history of multicellular life on Earth, super complex life. In fact, the majority of our history yes. of life on Earth is pretty, it's pretty darn simple stuff. Mm -hmm. And most of it is unicellular, it's just one cell. Something happened, we're not gonna dwell on that, that's not the subject matter of the day, but there's a, a history of complex multicellular life, even complex multicellular life with brains, sophisticated nervous systems, that goes way back and way back before the kind of sociality yeah. that we're talking about. So here's the devil's advocate part. I'm perfectly okay with invoking the idea that consciousness, of course, predates humans, I'm talking about very, very sophisticated nervous systems with, with you know, multiple brain areas, uh, sophisticated mm -hmm. sensoria, different sensory apparatuses in combination with a sophisticated motoric function. And there's a really complicated environment. And we can probably all agree that at some point during evolution in the marine environment, things got really complicated after a time. But yeah. the social dynamics of human beings, they're sort of re relatively recent in the game, right? There was sociality before that, clearly. We can infer that from living species that certainly have ancestors that go that predate the evolution of Homo sapiens, the evolution of the genus Homo, the evolution of hominins in general. So here's the point. There's certainly a social domain that's important to talk about vis-a-vis -vis consciousness and its adaptive function, its utility, et cetera, et cetera. But something yeah. must have been around before. I mean, very, and it did take a, like a, a very long time when you look at the history of, of Earth as a calendar, as a yearly right. calendar, right. as is done by Carl Sagan. Yeah, which is it. wonderful. And, and so yeah. um, you know, January, uh, beginning of time and yeah. now. New Year's Eve and like a yeah. minute before Human, is us. Humans <laughs> have, uh, didn't even uh, exist until the 10 seconds before midnight. Exactly. So, you know, all of this, and as you said, the vast majority was unicellular. You know, right. So this is like very, very recent. If we, yes. you know, a random visit you know, right. on life at Earth wouldn't include us right. you know, in terms of or anything close. And so one of the questions is sort of, um, is uh, social cognition, social working together, is it sort of um, an outcome of consciousness right. uh, versus an integral part of it? And now um, I'm changing my view a bit because now I'm thinking it, it may be that you know, consciousness allowed us the social aspect, but it's not really the essence of consciousness. Like, could you be conscious if you were right. you know, dropped on an island as a baby and, and right. you had no human? I think probably yes, you would still meet my definition of whatever conscious is right. even with no other, you know, as a feral child, so to speak. Let's know, introduce a, a couple of useful benchmarks. First useful benchmark. We know that mammals and birds first appeared on Earth distinctively from two reptile ancestors, two different reptile ancestors, between 215 and 230 million years ago, roughly. First mammals, first birds, mm -hmm. right? We also know, and there's very firm evidence of this, that birds left behind caches of eggs, bird-like dinosaurs left behind caches of eggs. The eggs were arranged in sorts of geographies and implying, in fact, that there was some sort of sociality. It's not the kind of sociality that has us here sitting talking about the nature of consciousness today, but some aspect of sociality must have existed back then and must have been relevant, perhaps, to this whole question of what consciousness is and when, when who has it, when did it mm -hmm. appear. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to leave it there as a sort of the starting point. So that's our that's our sort of first benchmark. And I would make the claim I could predict that ability from the brain. Mm. And so with uh, Robin Dunbar's work, the best predictor of the size of the cortex across 38 different primate species mm -hmm. is how big is the social group. Mm, All right. the things you could wonder about. That's in terms right. of like, and so it's very, very strong in terms of our ability to have a, a wider sharing of mm. reality mm -hmm. maps wonderfully onto the brain. I really think that you, you could look at it from that perspective in terms of, of what would be the anatomy, what would be the hardware necessary to pull this off. Sure. And I think that we would sort of be able to predict that this animal you know, could be social, meaning that it has the complexity to share, you know, to, to get constant feedback, to convey um, its interpretation 
that reality with others. And that might be an interesting aspect of, of both consciousness across species, but again, in babies, you know, in terms right. of, of um, a conception, no, by 21, yes, somewhere between them when it crosses a line. I'd be interested if whether you could predict from looking at the hardware of the brain or, or functions, ah, now, you know, now consciousness is at least possible, you know, now it's not. It, it also blends right into the, the artificial intelligence. Yes. yes. Oh. The proportional cortex to mom cortex, what is that like over you know, periods of time? Because one of the strong hypotheses, I know of course, is that cortex is the organ of mind, as Penfield said, in 1934, yeah, it was evidently right. I mean, the the, the word the word comes from um, the Latin word for bark, like bark of a tree, right. you know, in terms of of, of, of cortex. And um, in humans, it's mostly about six layers thick, mm -hmm. right? Um, but there are places where it's three, and, or and some five people even suggested up to nine, up to nine, I guess, which on, not right. yeah, and you know, demonstrated sure. and such. And so now I'm thinking not you know not that way anymore because. Um, a word that you used in your definition in terms of, um, so mine is more kind of a textbook and simplistic, like self-awareness, you know, mm -hmm. right, right, which right. is not very really helpful because it's certainly <laughs> but, but one of the aspects was weaving, the, the weaving together aspect. Yes. And so there's been a lot of emphasis on the cortex because that's where the business happens. That's where the actual well, exchange of... Well, so, uh, pardon me for interrupting. Uh, uh, so we're talking about the rim. Um, yeah, and then and because of how it folds the, and stuff, some of it's inside, but yeah, right. yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. And also yeah. sort of referentially long di so long distance pro projections. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Their importance to all of this. And, and not yeah. coincidentally, one of the areas that we're only finally starting to avail of ourselves of methodologically, i.e., through diffusion tensor imaging, through more sophisticated yes, versions yeah. of, of fMRI. Of MRI. Exactly. Right. It was a little bit like DNA, where they had, when I was, you know, junk DNA. Right. And now, it's not junk. It's no junk. junk. <laughs> and so that's what the kind of the cortical chauvinists, I guess, is some of the people, you know, talking about. Oh, I'm one uh, of you know, Right. And it's not that the cortex isn't, you know, essential, but that in terms of the idea of weaving together, the, the non-cortical aspects, I think, mm -hmm. are, are equally as intriguing. Um, because the, the development, it, it follows wonderfully, just as you said, in terms of how the brain becomes the brain. The mm -hmm. very first things to develop are what keep us alive. Right. Heart rate, breathing. And after, they don't really change that much. You right. know, like they work and let's, let's keep they with do what that. They do. Right. And, and, and then the, the traditionally five senses, uh, um, uh, sound, uh, smell, sight, taste, touch, you can argue it might be one or two more, or, but they, they kind of develop. At a pretty young age, they're as good as they're going to get. And, and your eyes, about five, you know, they work every bit as well as, you know, as, as they'll work. And this is not just metaphorically, this is looking at the anatomy. Mm -hmm. The next step then is, is exactly you said, this kind of sensory binding. Mm -hmm. And so you, you um, looks like a duck, sounds like a duck, mm -hmm. uh, and feels like a duck kind of thing. You can actually image that. I mean, you literally see, exactly. oh, now yeah. the sensory for a vision is connecting to, um, right. and, and the so-called association area is tied all together. Right. And, and then to keep going, it's sort of these uh, so-called embedded hierarchies. So first we bind sight and sound, and then mm -hmm. we add more, but it, but it keeps going. Mm -hmm. And so we can then see, um, and I mean, literally see anatomically how, how, this integration happens, right. and and they keep sort of integrating more and more up to the the prefrontal cortex. So this part of the brain that is doing exactly as you're saying, you know, doesn't really um, stop dramatically change by age 25. There you go. So quite a bit later than you know originally the, imagined. And the sort of the brain sort of yeah, you see it's exactly what David is saying. This, this idea of of tying it all together, of integrating mm. both within our body and in the outside world. You know, from mm -hmm. mom to family to you know, community oh, school, I'm still working and and, on that. and I wouldn't <laughs> argue that you're not conscious until 25, mm -hmm. you know? but I might argue that the nature of more conscious, conscious right. you know, and that it changes. Right. And so that's a fundamental question that I've completely you know, <laughs> failed. Uh, another one that I've kind of failed to solve is consciousness like that. I think there is some, um, um, as Gerald described, you know, sort of your sleep and now you're not asleep. Mm -hmm. 
we get that. Right. But but are there many shades of gray in between, or are there um, um, bins of you know sort of other discrete things like sleep is sleep? We will actually know that's not right. There's right. different types of sleep. Right. Drowsiness, awake, and then that's it. Right. Or does it keep going? Do we become more conscious mm. as our brains become more? Connected, integrated. I guess even extending that, do become more conscious as we get older. That I don't know, but well, I'd be fascinated to hear your thoughts on. The, the only thing I disagree with you on that, and it's not much of a disagreement, uh, is that the term "more conscious" yes. has so many different meanings. Right. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. I, I would ask you to to explain which particular meaning you're using. I, I would like to. You know, try to unpack that a bit because I'm I'm going back to your, your you know ideas of, of weaving together and mm -hmm. persistence of things and wondering within those you know two components would we expect you know to get better at it as we you know go through life um, or not in terms of is there a point where sure. um, like like with vision like yeah this is as good as it gets you know about five yeah, oh, you, yeah. Um, and other things even you know earlier. Mm -hmm. And they and they kind of even anatomically they they lock and load. You don't want that to change, but other things like the hippocampus and these, these association areas they they never they don't finish. They don't lock and load. And to further complicate it, no. at least structure structurally, anatomically, and, and mm -hmm. functionally, uh, one of the issues that relatively recently, i.e., within the past twenty years, through the work of people like. Uh, Fred Gage, Rusty Gage, yes, yes, uh, yeah, and other mm -hmm. folks mm -hmm. demonstrating, you know, with some bit of contention, right, or not a little bit of a lot of contention, actually, that in fact there's a lot of neurogenesis going on. Well, in human beings, mm -hmm. this is tougher to pin down, but we do know at least there's a degree of this going on in hippocampus, and the olfactory system doesn't necessarily surprise me. It's such a weird system to begin with. It's a very strange system. It's it's early. Well, it's early, it's ancient, yes. and it's also one of the few, first of all, it's one of the few areas that doesn't pass direct, most of it doesn't pass directly through the thalamus. Right. It bypasses yes. it, yes. Yeah. as if somehow the thalamus yeah. is overlaid maybe evolutionarily on this. It was around far earlier. Even um, when we were with the dinosaurs or our ancestors, olfaction was a was more important than vision. Exactly. Because we, we, we scurried around at night. To, <laughs> but it, it's one of the rare... It's one of the rare places in the brain. If you look at the olfactory lobe and you look at the the uh, you know the uh, the axons passing through the cribriform plate, basically the cribriform into yeah. the olfactory bulb. Um, Did you see a piriform? Or no, no, cribriform. Cribriform. It's the it's the bony plate where it's full oh, of holes see, and, and the axons pass through. Yeah. Okay. It's interesting because there seems to be sort of a, kind of a one to one wiring scheme between those axons mm. and um, the glomeruli. It's a very strange organization, yeah. but by the same token, so it's one to one kind of wiring, which is really unusual in the brain, as we all know. It, it defies what we think of in the most of the rest of the cortex. But it's really intriguing, and it's also very a hotbed of neurogenesis. It's there's a kind of a refresh going on. There's new stuff being generated. Yeah. New so material. would you define I mean, glomerularly for me? How would you define glomerularly? I mean, the, 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 the <laughs> it's so certain, it's sort of like anatomical it, it, architecture. It's a gang. It's like almost a, like a um, ganglion. It's like a you know a, a sort of a, so a clump. So it's, it's a bulb. Yeah, I guess it's you could say they're bumps. They're not. Yeah. Bumps are yeah. A bunch they're of knots. Knots, maybe. Okay, yeah. fine. All right. But, but it is like both action. We have very few words in our vocabulary, actually, for That's smell true. that don't relate to taste directly. Right. And, so. yep. and yet, from an anatomical standpoint, it should be kind of a, a big deal, you know, in terms yeah. of like, and it's very tied to our emotional system. Right. But I think it. So I'm, I'm looking at the word consciousness. It kind of, in some ways, sort of flies beneath the radar. In casinos, they're very aware of, of what different odors cause you oh, to really? gamble, more or less. Oh. And so they looked at very expensive perfumes, Chanel Number no. Five, and, and and what was the big winner was Good and Plenty, the, the, <laughs> yeah, the kind funny. of licorice scent, the so, anise, or the yeah, and, and, yeah. and it, it releases oxytocin. And, it, and so I think like a lot of um, the um, uh, perfume industry and stuff knows this, you know, knows this at a, a empirical level kind of thing. Yeah. But what we rarely talk about it. We really kind of appreciate sort of the, well, the, the importance of uh, in consciousness, you know, and in, in um, that we're 
our ability to detect odors is scary good. Like, mm. like even amongst other animals, it can be like a molecule. Tens, that, you know, tens of millions you know, of discrimination. Um, but we, we tend yeah. to, uh, um, I think, not focus on it as much as, even when you were saying earlier examples of, of um, cookies and, and those right. kinds. It's part of it, right? and often before vocabulary, which is round three, right? So you have these memories you go back to your grandma's house and there's something familiar right. about it. You it's can't a, and, and, and about it, to it's, talk yeah. about invo invoking Proust is an interesting, the yeah, smell yeah. of the Madeleine in the cafe. Yep. Proust has these very, yeah. these very florid sort of descriptions, right? It completely right? unlocks the whole memory catalog. The recall of sensation, yeah, sort of yeah. the recall of sensation. Okay, let me just stop short here for just a second because we bring up an interesting point. There's sort of a thought experiment that every one of us, scientists and non-scientists, can alike can can do, right? Think about the memory of your different sensoria. My own perspective on smell is that, you know, I can't really reconstruct in my recall, I don't I don't re-experience, I don't have a picture of the smell of freshly mown grass. But I, I know it when I when I smell it, and I and I remember, oh, yeah. and I remember particular days on which th that smell was very pungent, usually in relation to some other salient thing that happened, right? Yeah. So I remember when I was eight years old, a giant praying mantis landed on my four-year-old sister's um, shoulder, mm -hmm. and I went absolutely nuts, and I, I ran, mom, mom, a big dragon is on Judith, get it off, get it off, and and the interesting thing is I remember the sight. And I also remember, I remember that there was this smell of freshly mown grass. Mm. But here's the distinction. I can sort of see yeah. my sister in the praying mantis yeah. in my mind's eye. There's, I can't yeah. smell the smell, re-smell the smell. It's not. But you can recognize. No, but I can recognize it. But the point about it is I can't, there's no sort of uh, uh, odorant imagery, shall we say. You know, at least in my head. Yeah. I don't, you know, I know it when I see it, but it almost but seems you like. you have a word for it. I have smell, a word for it, smell of, of, of course, right. but it's not like I can read when I do a recall, I'm not recalling the actual, it's not like I'm smelling it all over again. Whereas when I recall seeing something, I have a picture in my mind's eye. There's no such thing so, for me. So here's like. a question, a very traditional question in psychology, mm -hmm. uh, 19th century. Uh, and there was a theory mm -hmm. about imagery and about the difference in imagery between children and adults. Mm -hmm. And also between men and women. And there's some wonderful experimental ideas. We have no idea how good the evidence was, of course. But, but these are kind of informal things. So, uh, so in one study, uh, I think it may have been Galton. Is that possible? Could be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you take the members of the Royal Society, right, the big science outfit, and they're all professorial dons, and, and they spend their lives living their heads, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they just kind of wander around, you know, and, and bump into things. And then there are their wives, who would typically be, you know, keeping them from bumping into things. Mm -hmm. And you ask the, both the men and women, uh, how vivid their images are, visual images. Mm -hmm. are. It turns out the women's are far more vivid Hmm. than the men's, and that was at least in 1870. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's probably true. Yeah. And I think children, uh, very, very plausibly, at least in my mind. The, uh, I have even like an extension of that in terms of, um, I look at um, people that have something other than XX or XY. Uh, so traditional XX is female, XY is male. Uh, About one in 400 births is something else. Mm -hmm. Three X's, four X's and a Y, three X's, two Y's, X, Y. So I have over 400 people that I've been following that have the, well, all the known variations yes. of this. So one, one of them is triple X. Hmm. So, and they, so they're super female, you know, they're, they're fine. You know, we wouldn't know somebody here. Right. But our ability to discriminate colors um, comes down to um, the, the, the cones mm -hmm. in our eye, which are a certain genetic variation. We have these cells that are receptive to roughly red, blue, green, you know, kind of. Um, are they tetrachromats? They are, yes, exactly. So, so four, four, yes. four flavors so of they, So they can have more Not variety. Three. Exactly oh. correct, yeah. And so they can perceive more colors. 
what kind of goes? Uh, they, they can say the like this is them. orange and this is burnt orange. Yeah. So they, they can literally can, can, you know they can yeah, they perceive, but they don't know. know. Yeah. Right. You go through life, you're basically it's second seeing, nature. You're seeing a no. you know four you know another right. dimension of thing. You never know it. Right. And 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 it, another thing that you never know. So but going back to the olfactory bulbs, another another group is called Kalman syndrome. Kalman mm -hmm. with a K, mm -hmm. and they don't have olfactory bulbs. Mm, really? Yeah, and so one of the things the olfactory bulbs do is they kind of grow from the middle toward the front of your brain, mm -hmm. and they're like a, a train. And these certain other cells, uh, like hobos, they hop onto the train, mm -hmm. and they get carried. And these are cells that release basically hormones. And there's only 300 cells in even healthy people. Um, so they don't experience puberty. In terms of that's that's why we see them. Really, the, the lack of smell nobody knows because if you don't know that you don't have a, how would you know, right? You go that's through right. life, yeah, think, right. Oh, that would be so What's bad. All the how do you know? You know when the cookies are done, but but it's surprising. You can go, you don't realize that you're different. No, just, just like the summer. just like the tetrachromes, like you know they're seeing a more vivid world mm -hmm. basically, but they don't know. They have nothing to compare it to. They assume everybody sees the world mm -hmm. as which we kind of all do. Metaphorically, in some ways, right? We kind of assume everyone sees the world as we do. Think about mantis shrimp with thirteen to fifteen. Wow! So that, and wouldn't that be cool? That actually, like, right? Different the, photoreceptors. Yeah. 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 So it, it's sort it's of it, it's sort of like visualizing four dimensional. We couldn't even see it. I mean, right. like you can't you can't create something that we can experience because right. we don't have the hardware to appreciate right. exactly. That and not so, and not so yeah. coincidentally, wow, the, this variety of sort of arthropod. The decapods, I don't remember, but mm. they also happen to be very colorful, huh. which, you know, as adult, wow. you know, they, they, so it would matter in their survival if they yeah. could discern uh, different species or potential mates. Absolutely. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 So I think let's just pull back for just a second because we've, we've hit on an interesting little light motif here, which is sort of the rich variety of conscious experience by virtue of, you know, the richness of our sensoria and on the other side of things. The, the, the capacity for the brain to kind of pick this apart, put it back together again, et cetera, uh, et cetera. Over evolution, but also over 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 developmentally, life. right? And, and both the individuality of it and the sharedness. Of right. It. Right, right. So I think we're all on the same page here. I'd like to thank Bernie Barris and Jay Geed for a wonderful discussion today. I'm neuroscientist David Edelman. Thank you for listening and for tuning into the podcast on Consciousness with Bernard Bars.